she'd get her kiss on the forehead and we'd hold hands for a while and talk and uh, uh, she was a gift she was preciousness itself and uh, she has enriched all of our lives yes do pray for me as we ask God's blessing on the message Father we continue to ask for your unctioning, your keeping power, your grace, and your mercy. Be with this family that is in deepest grief. They can't get around it. They can only go through it. We pray, Savior, that you take them through. We pray that you would help them as the sea billows roll. Healing is available. It comes in time. Hold their hands, Lord Jesus. Take them through. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you and to us as I would try to make use of these moments to teach, instruct, and to help us all. This is a prayer I offer up in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone has said, it is not the duration of someone's life that counts, but rather the donation. It counts and has amply been said again and again what a donation she has made. Melissa's life was by God's providence not an especially long one, but oh, what a contribution she's made to our lives. Melissa was not defined by her limitations, her illness, or her handicaps. She did not let them make her unhappy or keep her from being involved. You've heard that throughout our time. In fact, her life is a witness against any who would dare to say, I did not serve God because I was angry. He allowed me to be born handicapped or sick or infirmed. Some of you are full-bodied and refuse to make your lives count for eternity. Melissa's life says, shame on you. Shame on you. Beware, my friends. Heaven will be filled with examples like Melissa and Marvin, one of our deaf members that we will funeralize in a few short hours, who were not defined by their illnesses or handicaps, who God will use as a stinging rebuke for the ungodly churchgoer or bitter agnostic who say that God has been unkind to allow them to be born with some manner of infirmity. Melissa McCarty was born June 10th, 1992, and was taken home to heaven November 7th, 2011. She lived a life characterized by pain and suffering and joy. But in her short life, she taught us many things. How to suffer with dignity. How to inspire others. How not to let life defeat you. In fact, there are many messages that beg to be preached today, such as this one. The faithfulness of parents in ministering to a child with chronic condition. Church, I'd like for you to stand to your feet and show and tell John and Marsha McCarty that you have never seen such love, such devotion, such a willingness. They didn't see it as a burden, though it was burdensome to them. They loved and cared for and ministered to this beloved child, this beloved young woman. They were so used to seeing miracles, if I may interject. They were so used to seeing her come back from the brink. Their little miracle child, indeed, Laverne. MMM, miracle after miracle after miracle. And you know, in the, the final week leading up to her departure from this life, it gets so hard to see someone in that kind of pain. Today, I want to be able to help us who sometimes have to come alongside that. I want to, I believe, give us some wisdom to know how to handle that and be helpful rather than hurtful. Three, three parts to my message. I want to accomplish a lot of things. and I kept on wanting to speak about her purpose, but the Lord wouldn't lead me that way. And I understand why, because so many have said her life here was for a purpose, to help us to... Uh, think right and walk circumspect. 
Yeah, like I said, there are many sermons to preach. Parents faithful to ministering to a chronic child. Another question, why do people suffer? Or why would a good God allow the young and innocent to die, to die while some evil people live on? Some of these are questions we'll never know the answer to. But today I want to touch on three, three topics, three, three items I believe will be helpful for us today. The first, how can we come alongside those who are chronically suffering and give them true comfort? Secondly, how to help us to see death not as a loss, but as a gain. And coming out of that, how we can make our lives, like Melissa, count for eternity. Brothers and sisters, we've all had someone close to us go through su suffering of some kind, and if you haven't, you probably will in this life. Whether it was someone as close as a spouse or a child, or whether it was only a friend and even an acquaintance, we've all been around people who suffer. And I don't know about you, but those times can be some of the most helpless times of our lives. What do you do? What do you say? How can you react? In the book of Job, I, I just want to pull some thoughts out of Job chapter 2 to, to help you to see some things. Job 1 and 2, we, we see that God is in heaven ruling sovereignly and his angels come before him and the devil comes as well and God says, hey, Satan, where have you been? You know my routine, God, roaming throughout the earth, looking for people to tempt and ruin. God says, have you, have you considered Job in all of this? Oh, God, you know you've got a hedge around him. Uh, don't talk, fool. And he says, but you know, if you allow me to, to get past that hedge, Job will show you with his own lips that he's not a God. He's not a man who is really serving you for the right reasons. You know the story. The devil is given liberty. And he brings ruin on Job and his wife. All of his wealth, all of his homes, all of his children gone one day. Bad news after bad news after bad news. Again, the scene shifts to heaven and Satan comes before the Lord and God said, Satan, where have you come from and where have you been? He says, Lord, you know. He says, by the way, have you noticed my servant Job? Though you incited me to allow this ruin to come on his life, still he honors me, still he reveres me. For remember, Job got up and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jo the devil is incensed. He says, It's only because you did not allow me to touch his flesh, is he this way, but allow me to touch his flesh, and we will see if he truly, truly truly serves you and so God says he is in your hands only spare his life and here's where we take up the reading Job 2 verse 7 so Satan went forth in the presence of Jehovah and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown and, he, and Job took a posture to scrape himself therewith and he sat among the ashes by the way the scriptures are clear Job is guilty of no sin God reveres him and honors him above all men. There is none like Job on the face of the whole earth. So those that would say that uh, illnesses and so forth are a result of sin, uh, this, this scripture quashes all of that. We know that's not the case here. But for those who in coming along to give grief, to give comfort, sometimes foolish things are said. And so we know from the scriptures that suffering is allowed by God as a test. But here's what takes place. Job is sitting among the ashes, and it says, Then his wife said unto him, Do you still hold fast your integrity, Job? Renounce God and die. But he said to her, You're speaking like one of the foolish women from the marketplace speaks. What, shall we receive good from the hand of God and not evil, not calamity? In all this Job did not sin with his lips. And here's a bit I want to help you with. This is to help us today. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Timonite, Bildad the Shushite, and Zophar the Namathite, and they made an appointment together to come to bemoan and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off, they knew him not. They lifted up their voice and they wept, and they rent every one of them their robes and sprinkled dust upon their heads towards heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word unto him, for they saw that his grief 
was very great. They saw that his grief was very great. Job's three friends, those three verses show his friends at their very best. Their friend is suffering greatly and they go to comfort him. Imagine seven days and seven nights sitting with a friend in abject pain and suffering and just being there to be with your friend. They did everything right in those three verses. But for the next 33 chapters, they completely undo all the good that they've done in the three verses. We give Job's friends a lot of grief, but I would say that to those of us gathered here in the room, we make the same mistakes. The fact is that suffering is hard. It's hard to understand. It's hard to endure. But I think more than that, it's hard to watch. It's hard to watch because we want to do something to help. More than that, the person who is suffering wants us to do something to help. But the problem is most of the time we can't. And that's tremendously frustrating. But friends, I'm here to tell you that in the midst of suffering, God does great things. Do you know that what drives many people to pursue their careers? When you begin to look at the background of many nurses, you'll find that they went into nursing because of the impact of having to watch someone close to them physically suffer. The same thing happens when you go into psychology. Many people go into psychology because of the impact of seeing someone close to them going through mental suffering. The other day I was having some blood work done and I was chatting with a girl that was uh, uh, serving me and as we talked she said she's going back to school and she was thinking of being a psychologist. And I said, may I ask why? And she said, yes. And I said, is it because there's someone who has a mental illness or has been debilitated by some kind of um, Alzheimer's and so forth, she said, yes, how'd you know? You see, there's something about us experiencing people in pain where it, in our helplessness, it drives us to want to do more. So pain is, is not wasted. Suffering doesn't have to just end there. What will be the fruit of Melissa's suffering among us? Will it raise up another Dwayne Sands or Percival McNeil? Will it raise up persons who are committed to pediatric care to help others in pain? When a friend of mine was going through brain uh, surgery and later on my son would, I met a woman who was a knockout. You wouldn't think she was a doctor. And it turns out before she wasn't. She was a beauty queen. But a child came down with a debilitating disease, and she switched her profession, became a brain surgeon. Her daughter passed, but her life was changed, impacted by suffering, made a difference. What will Melissa's life produce in us? Many people have come into ministry because they've seen the problem of pain, and they've wanted to know how to comfort others. I like the story one pastor speaks about this issue of that sense of helplessness we face when we're around someone who's suffering. He writes, I remember when my wife was pregnant with our daughter. We went through all of the childbirth Lamaze classes. Do you know what the amazing thing about those classes was? They actually had me convinced that I was going to have some part to play in the delivery. And I was ready. Oh, I had all the steps down. I knew how to coach her with her breathing. I was fully prepared until we got to the hospital. <laughs> and when we got to the hospital, I was about as useful as Job's friends. I might have had a good moment or two like they did, but most of it was worthless. Why was it worthless? Because I kept trying to do something to make it better. And when someone is going through a time of suffering, they don't need you to do something. Most of the time, they just need you to be something, a comforter, who will sit there with them in their pain and pray. <clears throat> yes, there will be time later when perhaps we can help, but in the time of that grief and suffering, we just need to be there, a shoulder to cry on. When someone is 
suffering close to you, there's some do's and don'ts you should be aware of. Don't minimize their suffering. Don't give pious platitudes. Don't over-dramatize it either. Just be there with them. Don't run on about a cousin who was going through that and, and, and you know, I, I know what you're going through. Leave that right there. You don't. Another mistake we make is we are quick to try and fix the problem. When someone close to you is suffering, don't immediately try to fix it, friends. Behind all of their blustering, that's all Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar were trying to do. Each of them thought they knew what was wrong, and they were encouraging Job to fix it. But Job didn't need anything to be fixed. God's verdict on him was that his life was blameless. But this was a season of testing in his life. All he needed from them was their friendship and their comfort. You know, uh, some would call this a sexist statement, but I think this is a man problem. Women are good at just being there, supportive and caring. Men want to be fixers. They come in there, they want to fix it. And there were many times I was at the bedside of Melissa and I just wanted to fix it. But how was I going to fix it? You can't fix this. But one thing I noticed I could do, I could hold her hand, we could talk, I could wipe her brow, we could laugh, I could pray, I could be there and be a support. Don't be so quick to try to fix a problem. Don't be so quick to give your thinking and thoughts. You see, that's another thing that is often done when people are suffering. Bad advice is often given. I want to encourage you when someone is suffering. The McCarty's are suffering before us. The Carols are suffering. Don't give bad advice. You see, that's what Job's wife did. Keep in mind, it wasn't only Job suffering. I want to make this clear. She too lost all of her house and possessions. She too lost the ten children, and I'll tell you, Job may bear none of them. She did. So this woman is in pain. And in pain sometimes foolish things can be said. And she had said to her husband, let's just abandon this whole thing. Let's curse God and die. Are you still holding out any hope that God is good? That's bad advice, wasn't it? How in the world would cursing God and die make anything better? Would that have brought their wealth back? Would that have made Job's disease go away? Would that have brought their children back to life? Of course it wouldn't have. But often people in grief get the same destructive advice. He cheated on you. You need to take him for everything he's worth, says a friend to their, says a friend to their hurting friend who finds out that the spouse is cheating. She doesn't know how to treat you. You just might have to leave and take care of your own needs. The bottom line is you don't give advice unless you ask for it. And then give, that, give the advice that is true and factual and biblical. Don't give out bad, unsolicited advice. Right along with all of that is we like to have all the answers. When someone close is suffering... I want to encourage you, I'm a pastor, trained, Pastor Rex, trained, qualified. There's sometimes Pastor Hannah, trained, qualified. You just don't know what to say. Just keep quiet. Just be quiet. Just be there. Just hold a hand. People who are suffering aren't always looking for all the answers. Most of the time they're just looking for a shoulder to cry on. But sometimes they will ask why questions. Job asked a lot of them. But when someone is in the middle of suffering, is asking a lot of why questions, it's not time for us to launch into a theological treatise on the nature of evil. They have a right to ask questions. And sometimes they're just asking. Friends, the time to work on your boat is not in the middle of the storm. 
The time to work on your boat is before the storm comes. The time to seek the answers to difficult questions is before suffering comes. The time to shore up your theology is before your faith is tested. Because in the middle of the storm, all you have time to do is bail water. That's all you have time to do. It's not time to remind the boat builder of all the pairs they should have been about while the sun was out. That brings us to the last don't do, a catch-all. When someone is close to you is suffering, don't make it worse. The one thing that you notice as you go through the book of Job is Job started off very well. He didn't understand it. He asked God why he was having to go through all of it, but he never questioned God's sovereignty. He never questioned God's integrity. He had some amazing passages of faith that came out because of Job's suffering. I just want to share a few. You see, suffering has a way. The Bible says when we suffer, the glory of God, in fact, it says the Shekinah glory of God comes and dwells with us. And you better believe if God is present with us, there's wisdom, there's comfort, there's soul satisfaction. Here are some of the amazing things Job, that came out of Job's experience of suffering that to this day, and funerals around the world are said again and again. Here's what he said. Naked, uh, chapter 1, verse 21. Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What perspective? Friends, this earthly tent that we live in is fading away. Some of you ladies in here, who ain't looking good is good looking. And you could powder up, rouge up, do your hair. And, but you know what, folks? This body of yours is going to die. You can tuck, cut, lift, drop, whatever you want to do. You're going to die. And if your whole life is a concentration on keeping your beauty beautiful, you've missed the boat. Because you're going to die. You can't take your beauty with you. You can't even keep the age spots off you. You can cover them up. But friends, so that should tell us, Melissa's short life should tell us, it doesn't make sense just focusing on the here and now and dealing with our bodies in the here and now. Naked you came into this world and naked you go return. I don't care what the size of your bank account is. The Lord has given and the Lord takes away. Brilliant theology. The Lord can take it all away from you folks. There's only one thing, one post you can have. Have the attitude, blessed be the name of the Lord, who gives, who takes away, who gives life, breath, health, who allows calamity, but he makes all things work out for the good of those who love him and who call according to his purpose. In the midst of Job's suffering comes great truths that we can benefit from. Another one. God says, uh, Job says this in Job 9.32. For he is not a man as I am that I should answer him, and we should come together in judgment. Neither is there any uh, mediator, a, a day's man betwixt us, says the King James, that I might lay his hand upon us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not his fear terrify me. Then I, then I would speak and not fear him. But it is not so with me. But thanks be to God, a mediator has shown up and has uh, uh, brought man and God near in salvation. Job 19.25, oh, everybody's favorite passage. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. You see, friends, before this, no one knew anything about resurrection. Before this, everyone thought you just died and the worms took your body. But Job says this, you see, the Shekinah glory is on him. God is with him. And revelation just comes pouring out of Job. And here's what he says, for I know, how do you know that, Job? You've never seen this. You don't know these things. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. And he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Who knew this before Job? Job doesn't even, the Redeemer even showed up yet, but Job, because he is having this precious moment with the, the Shekinah of God, Job now understands things that men have never seen before. My Redeemer lives, and I, he will stand on the earth, and even though I die, 
I will live again because in my flesh shall I see the glory of God. And I will see it with my own eyes, not another. Friends, there's some precious truths that can only be arrived at in suffering. Dr. Wallace read from James. Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter trials of various kinds, knowing what they produce in you, knowing that they produce character and hope and, and a nearness to God you've never had before. Friends, because the Hebrew boys were in the fiery furnace, they got to know God up front, close and personal. God was in the fiery furnace with them and the fire did not burn them. Me and you ain't had that experience before. Those Hebrew boys did in affliction. God was there with them. <coughs> Tremendous words of worship poured forth from Job's mouth. Let me move to our second, uh, second theme I want to get at today. Some of you will say, what a loss. Beautiful young woman. She didn't get to have a, a boyfriend, an engagement, and a marriage, and, and have children, and so forth. What a loss. What a loss. Oh, really? Neither did Jesus. Neither did Jeremiah. And yet their lives teach us even now. Melissa was here to be an example for us. That in pain we can trust God. That in suffering we can remain faithful to God and believe him to be a true friend. You see, her affliction did not make her bitter, it made her better. And oftentimes as I lingered by her bedside, I wonder who was a pastor and who was the congregant? Because she had a way of ministering to me. I can still, I can still remember the times when her eyes were, were, were starting to get bad. and um, I would come and she would see someone who was there and she said, Who is that? I said, It's Lyle. Pastor Lyle! And just a face just lit up. And I thought, Oh my gosh, this is priceless. And here it was, I was tired. I thought, man, this day has been too long. I just got to go home now. But I say, you know what? Melissa is probably wondering, am I going to come today? And you know, that made that decision all the more worth it. Because, you know, that, that smile is priceless. And that, that, that hug is priceless. And you sit there and she ministers to you. I want to say to you, based on the authority of God's word in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, that it's not a case of that's too bad for Melissa. Well, my Bible tells me, in the words of Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Friends, I'm going to come back at you with that one. You see, because there are persons sitting here who perhaps you've pitied the sad life that Melissa has had. Don't pity her. I pity you if you've not done something with her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because you would have lived a healthy, full, wasted life. But I'm here to tell you today, Melissa McCarty has gained, gained big time. What has she gained? Five things I want to point out as we would bring our message time to a close. We learn from the scriptures that one of the things we gain is this. We gain a better body. We gain a better body. The same body that Jesus was brought back to life with, this, this powerful body that can move back and forward through, uh, through walls, through space and time. This body that will, uh, cannot grow old or decay. We gain a glorified, immortalized, resurrected body. In this present body of clay was subject to all the tears and sorrows that life is heir to. Age, sickness, and finally death are the inevitable accomplishments of this house made of clay and the dust of the earth. But in death and in the resurrection we gain a better body. One that can never grow old, no disease, suffer pain, that doesn't need dialysis, 
We gain a better body, no more arthritis, diabetes, migraines, cancers. Hallelujah. We gain a brand new body. To live is Christ, and to die is not loss, to die is gain. The gaining of a better body. What else do we gain? We gain a better home. Now, Melissa's dad is an architect, and you know, on one of those visits, or even two, might have been two, one of them visited him in um, Eleuthera, and he showed me his work, and I said, boy, this boy know what he's doing. This fellow's got an eye for detail. He know how to build a house. But Melissa is getting a house built by a better architect, built by a father that loves her even more than John did. No matter how beautiful your home is here on earth, it can never compare to the mansion that God is building for us in the city of God. According to John 14, 1 through 3, our Lord is preparing for us a, a dwelling place in the heavens. We do not get our heavenly mansion in, in this life. We only take possession of it in death. Remember the words of the chorus, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My home is laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me to heaven's golden shore, and I don't feel at home in this world anymore. Melissa has moved on to our heavenly rewards. What do we gain beyond a better body, a better home? Friends, we gain a better inheritance. Our final inheritance is not here, but it's in the heavens. And some of you who are waiting for mommy and daddy to die, and it's only a breakout in a fight. I like that old bumper sticker that says, we're spending our children's inheritance. <laughs> I, think, I think some parents, for their children's sake, need to give away their inheritance. Give it to a cause rather than to have those good children of yours uh, turn into animals fighting like scavengers over things they didn't earn and by appearances don't deserve. Melissa will gain a better inheritance. Her final reward is not here on the earth, but in heaven. It's only between the gates of death that we can even hear the precious words of our Lord, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter into your rest. But brothers and sisters, we don't just gain a better body, a better home, a better inheritance, but we gain a better fellowship, a better fellowship. All of us in this world live in a dissolving family circle. Family members are dying. I told a family during the viewing of the, uh, the body that as I grew up and even after I became a believer at age 17, I would hear about heaven and, yeah, did nothing for me. Streets of gold. Crystal Sea, yeah, nothing. But when my family members began to die and pass on, I realized there were treasures in heaven that I now long to see. A departed grandmother, beloved cousin slash sister-in-law, and heaven has been filling up with the treasures on earth that left this earth that I am desperate to see. For some of you, mother is gone, or father is gone, or child is gone, or beloved grandparents are gone, friends are gone. If we live long enough, we shall be strangers in this earth with no one that we knew. Everyone we knew and loved will be gone. But the circle is unbroken in heaven forever and ever, and there's no death there, no sorrow, no crying and pain, for the former things have passed away. But best of all, beyond our families and friends who wait to greet us there, we shall see the face of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God and be with our Lord forever in eternity. Do you know the song? When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, for his smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know him, I shall know him, as redeemed by his side, I shall stand. I shall know him. I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hands. 
Friends, as I close. If for me to live is Christ, then to die is gain. But if for me to live is money, then to die is loss. Friends, if you're living for money, if you're living for wealth, then to die for you is loss. If for me to live is pleasure, then to die is loss. If for me to live is to please self, then to die is loss. If for me to live is this world, then to die is lost. But if for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To die is gain. Melissa McCarty made a decision a long time ago that changed her life forever, changed her direction, changed her destiny. She made the choice of making Jesus Christ her Savior and Lord. And for Melissa, to live was Christ. In John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible says, A man must be born again before he can enter the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, Melissa has departed this life. The Bible says, If a seed falls in the ground and dies, it bears much fruit. I believe that Melissa's life was a witness to us, an example to us, instruction to us. Her life tells us it is not the duration of life that is important. It is a donation. It is a contribution that we make. What is your contribution? Have you lived your life, broken though it might be, to the praise and glory of God? I warn you, Saying that you are blind and therefore you, you couldn't serve the Lord is a devilish lie. I warn you, saying that you are deaf and therefore you couldn't serve the Lord is a lie from the pit of hell. I warn you that saying because you were crippled or, or, or God allowed some hurt in your life and that's the reason why you're not serving the Lord is a lie designed in the pits of hell for which you will be held accountable. Elisa's life tells us no matter the trial, no matter the suffering, no matter the heartache, your life can count for something. Amen. Your life can make a difference. You see, Melissa was an ambassador wherever she went. Amen. Persons looked at her and wondered, how could a little girl, how could this little woman with all that she was going through still smile, still say, trust the Lord, still say, pray, still encourage you? Friends, Jesus on the inside made the transformation that we see on the outside. And I would use these last couple of moments to ask you, what will you do with Melissa's Jesus? The one that transformed her and made her life of great account. So that though her life was short, it was powerful. Your life is long thus far. Your health is good thus far but what has been your contribution Jesus says you need to die to yourself and allow me to live through you you wonder why Melissa can light up a room Christ resident in her you wonder why she can go through the pain she went through she realized that this life is only a stepping stone into eternity she saw her body deteriorate around her. She saw the outer beauty begin to fade, but we all saw the inner beauty come to life. Some of you beautiful people, you're ugly on the inside. You're wretched, poor, and blind. But Jesus says, come to me, and I will give you living water that will swell up inside of you. Come to me. I will teach you life. Come to me. Let me live my life through you. Come to me. Let me make something of your life. Come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you purpose. I will give you life. Amen. Jesus takes a broken down, used up woman, run through five men, a man she's living with, ain't even her own. But with a few short words with Jesus, her life is transformed. A demoniac 
Legion of demons in him. Hell for anyone to deal with. Jesus delivers him. And the man caused the whole town to consider Jesus, as did the Samaritan woman. Melissa McCarty got many people to consider Jesus. What about your life? Is your life an anti-witness? People say, well, if that's what a Christian is, I, I need to consider Buddhism. The song is playing. It's a beloved song in our church. Come to Jesus while you still have time. Friends, I'm here to tell you that you don't know when your life will end. As we lingered with the family on November the 6th, came back again the morning of November the 7th, it was evident, at least to me, that it wasn't long. Friends, you don't know if it will be that obvious or evident to you that your time is coming. You can leave this life quickly in a car accident or linger in pain having lost your mind. And so the only guarantee we each have is the time that is allotted to us now. Come to Jesus while you have time. My Bible says today is the acceptable time. Right now is the time to do business with God. If the musicians will come and just sing a verse or two of that, I will return with a word of prayer. And friends, I want to encourage you with the song singing, the Spirit of God moving. Make up your mind. Make up your mind. What are you going to do with Jesus? What has Melissa taught you in her final lesson? Isn't it a time to let go of a, a life of futility? A life of selfish and wanton living? A life of pleasure? Her life of pain is a rebuke to you. A life of health? A life of illness is a rebuke to you. A life of getting all the things in life that you look for and being cold towards God, Melissa's life is a rebuke to you. And so in these moments, while you have time, let me call you to come to Jesus while you have time. Shall we pray? Friends, I want to offer a prayer for you, and I believe that there are persons here among us who recognize that Melissa's life is a word to you, and you want to do business with God now while you have time. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like for you to raise your hand if you want to know Melissa's God and, and experience the joy that God gives despite your situation. Despite the calamity, like Job, you can say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. I will bless his name every day of my life. Is there a man, a woman, a young man, a young woman, a schoolmate perhaps? You want to do business with God. Melissa in death has spoken loudly that now is time to settle this matter of your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anybody? We don't want to prolong the service. I see that hand. Is there another? I'm sure there's another. I'm sure there's a few more. Yes. Is there another hand? Another person. Yes, I see that hand. Is there another? I see that hand. Yes. Church, please be praying. I see that hand as well. Yes. Please stand at your feet with me. I want to lead you in a, a prayer of repentance and asking Christ to come into your heart and life as Lord and Savior. Stand your feet if you raise your hand. Yes. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Now listen, it's the sincerity of your prayer to God that brings a soul to salvation. For the Bible says, with the heart one believes and with the mouth confession is made. And so you want to ask Jesus Christ, as Melissa did, to come in and be Lord and Savior to take up the directorate of your life, that he'd bring his Holy Spirit to give you power to live by. 
and that you would settle in a Bible-believing church where Jesus Christ is, uh, is taught, his ways made known, and encouragement given to live godly. Follow me in prayer. Lord Jesus, I recognize that my life needs to be changed. I recognize that I am a sinner, not able to save myself. I recognize that Jesus Christ died to save me. I recognize that by my life I cannot please you. But I invite you, Lord, into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. To remove the sin that is displeasing to God and that has been the means of my condemnation. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would apply it to Calvary and that you would give me your righteousness. Save me, Lord Jesus. Come into my life and be Lord and Savior. Save me from foolish living and thinking. Be Lord in my life. Teach me how to live. Teach me how to serve you. May your Holy Spirit fill me and give me wisdom that I might know how to live. Help me to find a Bible-believing church that teaches the Word of God and encourages holy living. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray for these folks as well, and I ask, Lord, that you would guard, guide, and keep that which they have committed to you. I ask that your Holy Spirit would protect, keep, and preserve them. May you sustain them, and may their lives be the kind of witness that Melissa's was, where others would see their life and their contribution, young though they may be, and recognize the Christ in them and desire him for their lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to invite Pastor Leroy Tinkle Hannah to come now and pray for the family. Before he comes, Elder Cardinal returns with some instructions. Yes, just before Pastor Hannah comes, Pastor Rex would like to bring condolences, and then Pastor Hannah will come and pray. Yes, I really need to say something because of my linkage with this family for so long in so many ways. And I want to especially hold up Clarence and Gwenny at this time and she suffer with your daughter's suffering, your son-in-law and the loss of your grandchild and their siblings. I would like to make this condolence expression on behalf of my family, all of them, as well as the Cartwright's Gospel Chapel family who praying for you and caring for you. Thank you very much. Let us pray. Father, We call on you now. Our very present help in times of trouble. We call on you, Lord Jesus Christ, a very present friend who weeps with us in moments like this. We call on you, gracious spirit, who brings a peace and that can transcend our deepest grief, pain, fears. We call on you to bring now to John and to Marsha and to Jasper and to Jenna the comfort they will need to get through the days and the weeks and the months and the holiday season and 
the birthdays but father with each passing moment I pray that they will be encouraged to know that for 19 years you brought a gift into their lives that made them better, a better father, a better mother, a better brother, a better sister, a better church, a better community. Father, I pray that they will know now and I pray now Father for the extended family the aunts the uncles the grandparents the cousins the friends I pray Father that they will experience you afresh in your mercy and in your grace as they have experienced you so many times in the past 19 years with Melissa. Father, draw so close to them. Draw so close to them that they feel your presence, Father. That in their weakest moments, they hear you speaking to them, saying, it's all right. You may bend, but you will not break. I will stand with you. And so, Father, I just pray, keep them in your peace, in your warm and tender love, in your grace and in your mercy, that in spite of all, they will continue to be able to minister to others and bring them peace. May your peace now be with them. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Hannah. And thank you, Pastor Lyle, for those sobering and appropriate words. <clears throat> As you can see from the program, we're going to be continuing the service at the graveside at Woodlawn Gardens in a few moments. Um, and I will be calling Elder Pete to lead us in our final song in a minute, but before we do that, I wanted to, on behalf of John and Marsha, let all of you, family and friends, know that following the graveside service, there will be a meal prepared um, at my home in um, Blair States, and all of you are invited to attend. Um, I know you're worried because it's my home. You think I'm cooking? No, it's the meals prepared by the twin brothers. Um, so, and you know, the twin brothers are older brothers to John. That's Buddy and Danny. So please come. More importantly, we want you there for your fellowship to be with the family right after the graveside service. So we look forward to seeing you there. If you need directions, you can see myself or one of the members of the family. And now, Elder Pete with my tribute. Let's all stand as we prepare to leave.
Hey! 